We're missing about maybe five to six people. Customers up to you. Do you want to start and get lunch early by telling them they missed out, or do you want to wait for them? I think you can start. They're, they already heard it, so go ahead.
retreat up, a retreat up the slopes of the Palatine until Romulus stopped them with a prayer to choose their start. The Jove the Sayer then reverses the course of the battle, and the Romans are now pursued, forcing the Sabines down the four mountains. It is at this point that Metius gets bogged down in the marshy lake in the middle. The story contrasts the heights of the Palatine and the Capitoline with the stress on the North Palatine approach along the Sacrovia, at the top of which the Temple of Jupiter Stato stood, as you can see here, uh, marked in red on the map. The battle reversal makes sense from a strategic point of view, but once the Romans take high ground, they have the upper hand against the enemy. The Forum Valley is pressed in the middle between the capital and the Palatine, and its watery aspects come to the fore. While other sources mention a lake or marsh, in the longest of all the accounts, Plutarch attributes the cause of the red terrain to a recent flood of the time. Though Plutarch could not have directly known the conditions of the early forum, the information is very significant because it fits the geological evidence we have, as we shall see. It is impossible to say when exactly Natus and Historia became attached to their forces, but time of flooding certainly played a role in its formation. The archaeological evidence for the fountain itself may not be very helpful in this regard. The earliest phase of the construction in Jupiter blocks dates to the second century BC and contains traces of obviously Ninu, a waterproof material. This fits with Livy saying that many fountains were monumentalized <coughs> in 184 BC. Lotus, in one of his comedies, places a lake in the middle of the forum, which matches its later position by Pliny. All these passing references imply that the sanctuary itself is older and the myth time tree transmitted by means of oral memory. The earliest stage was a circular wellstone, or butel again, 3.5 meters in diameter, as you can see on this um, sketch. The enclosure around it was built later and was trapezoidal in shape. A small channel to the west of the pool drained the water, at least partly, and a connection to an earlier stage of Barca Maxima is possible. The purpose of the Puteral, or wellhead, is unclear, but it certainly links with the third Baronian account, which if, you, which, if you remember, said the place was struck by lightning. In the passage that describes the fig tree next to Marcus Cortius, Pliny says, there is a fig tree in the Comitium area sacred because lightning was expiated at that spot. There was also a Puteral in the Comitium at the statue of Oberon and Artus Nineus, and it housed the sacred objects, stone and razor, which he used in his profession. The exact location is archaeologically unknown, but the fig tree Puteral and Marcus Fortius are very close to each other in the forum. Now, as we heard before, a sacred place is built to excavate a lightning stroke, a pulgur conditor, in the form of a lightning shrine, also called Vidental a pit in which the person was being struck were religiously deposited. Several examples from Rome and elsewhere have been studied. Such places were either circular or square, so in this <coughs> case it would be circular, uh, if it, it is indeed a, uh, if it is indeed a uh, They had an upper and a lower level, and were always left partly open because of their celestial origin. So the interpretation of Lavos Cortius as Bidental could be either a result of its trapezoidal shape, or more likely part of a tradition that is linked to the earliest stage of the sanctuary in the circular form of Buddha. This term applies to the curved stone of a well, which would imply the presence of water. There are more potential water features in the area. Um, in the tradition, the Roman enemy of Metius Curtius was called Postus Hostilius. Uh, this reads very much like an invented name, and according to the myth, he was buried at the Vulcan House. So coming back to this map, the shrine of Vulcan. Uh, so, uh, with the black stone of Lapis Niger later interpreted as his epitaph. The same Ignatius had initially caused the Roman army to rout <coughs> by killing Postus, who was later buried on the spot. 
The Volkanal is, of course, the sanctuary of the god Vulcan, and an area just south of the community was known as Aria Volcana. The Ludicus Catori took place at the Volcanal, when fish are sacrificed to the god Fire. The hot springs of the Lautuli are also placed in the same area next to the Black Stone, Lapis Nigga. It cannot be an accident that another story about the Battle of Sabines and the Romans is set here, but centered on the Temple of James. Uh, hot water issued forth from the temple and fended off the Sabine enemies. So in both myth and ritual, water plays a great role in the topography of this area. However, the general term Utel is also applied to sanctuaries of the dead, called Mundus, which of course also have a lower level. The Mundus had to be dry in order to store the grain supply, and was positioned as a <coughs> But the connection to Mundus as an underground sanctuary is particularly interesting. Uh, in, view of the, in view of Lily's description of the sacrifice of Marcus Curtis, the Mundus pit was located further west in the Forum and dedicated to the gods of the dead in the Marmot. Marcus Chum, in the story, resembles the ritual of the Bortio, or dedication, in which a Roman general offered his own life as a sacrifice to the Marmot. There are three instances of this type of ritual in the historical tradition. They are all attributed to the members of the Desi clan. When a battle went badly, a decus would ask the priest to consecrate him to the mountains. He would then ride off in full armor, alone in the midst of enemy troops, to serve the dead. The tale became a mythic trope at some point, but we know of at least one historical instance where it was connected to Roman victory. And I look forward to hearing Gaius talk about this uh, after his death. Marcus' death is very similar to the ritual act of the Volta. He looks to the gods above and below and devotes his life as a sacrifice. So, according to them, they say that Marcus Cortius, a youth excellent in war, criticized them for debating whether any Roman good can be better than virtue and weapons. Then, in silence, he beheld the temples of the gods and raised his hands now towards heaven and now down to the manes, and he opened the chasm earth, and finally dedicated his life. And Chris Snell notes a number of parallels between the two events. Marcus' dedication to the Manes, which we also found in Varro, parallels the dedication of the deity to Manes and Terras and Lim. The self-sacrifice is said to be conducted on behalf of the entire people to avert a catastrophe, defeat in the case of Deki, and the yawning chasm in the case of Marcus. In terms of status, Deci are the highest officials of the Republic, and Marcus is the most that Roman people can give. Livy actually uses the verb devovere to describe Marcus' action, which is at least a suggestion that he saw a particular. Marcus jumps riding his horse in military gear, which suggests a martial aspect as one would expect in a battle. The similarities Underlying the tonic aspect of market simulation, in particular the cult of the minds. Both Livy and Valerius Maximus see a large quantity of earth produce, <coughs> earth bodies of Brugges was thrown in after Cortes. This is immediately reminiscent of the position on the ditch or pit supposedly demarcating the Palatine Romerium, as set out by Romulus, into which a large quantity of earth fruits was thrown and also recalls the appearance of the moon is situated at the Temple of Saturn in the Forum, a corn silo open just before the celebration of such an early assembly. The circumstances of Marcus Jung are also very interesting. According to Livy, an outbreak of pestilence in 364 BC, two years before Marcus was jumped, led to the introduction of theatrical plays of Etruria, and the ritual celebration of Ludus Aculares, but the play continued, and in 362, Marcus jumped. The celebration of the secular games at the underground altar of this, or Pluto, adds more tonic elements to the story. The altar was buried several meters below ground level and ceremoniously dug up every hundred years or so for the rituals. 
hence the danger called Zentula from Cyclone. It was situated at the northwestern end of Campus Marshes and the place called Torrento, where the Ponte Victoria Manuela now stands. Now, Torrento was understood as a name for the Tiber in his destructive guide to the powerful river of erosion. Torrento means a crossing place, not just literally, but also metaphorically, a crossing to another world that is the focus of a cult of the dead. The Tiber is the key connection between the Forum and Campus Martians. This is readily apparent in Livy's account. In the year before Marcus John, there is a big Tiber flood, the only one attested in the records for the 4th century BC. It stops the games in the circus, a moment that causes panic and requires expiation. The Ctonic cults come into focus because they are closely linked to Boiter, the Tiber in particular. It is as if Marcus' sacrifice is an expiation ritual, both for the larger problem of the plague and the subsequent time of flooding. So far as I know, <coughs> no one's yet connected the sacrifice of Marcus with a major flood of the Tiber in the year preceding it. But the flooding explains why a sinkhole opened up in the ground, though one may doubt that this happened in the form of all places. Geologically speaking, sinkholes open up when water runs through unconsolidated ground, such as that made of sediments deposited by type of flooding. The Romans would have, would have opportunity to see this phenomenon for themselves the same way we do today. High levels of rainfall this year have caused as many as 44 sinkholes to open up in the low-lying areas of Rome up to April. And there has been an average of 19 sinkholes a year in Rome since 2010. This happens in areas uh, such as Prati, where the buildings of Rome stand on tiber sediments, slowly deposited over the centuries, with no stable ground to support the foundation. <coughs> so the parallel between the major flood of the tiber, just before the sacrifice of Marcus, and according to Plutarch, before the drowning of Metis, is striking. Both the settings, the sinkhole and the marsh, are a consequence of flooding. The differences are also important. While the death of the enemy saved by Metius is accidental, Marcus, as an exemplar of the church, volunteers to deliver the people from the, law, from the wrath of the gods that threatens the Comitium, the very center of the forum. Something changes about the topography as well. Romulus Forum is a wilderness a valley of trees and red marshland that made for a difficult battlefield. The Republican Forum is a place of business, religion, commerce and politics. The last thing one expects is for the ground to just open up and devour you in front of the sentinels. But the Lake of Courtius is not the only place that hides mysteries below the ground. There are a number of other fountains in the Forum, and more importantly, the underground moon space at the Temple of Saturn, and as we saw, several lightning shrines. Though they are not all the same, so the movies have to be dry in those smaller rates of they do all point to a belief in an underground level beneath the ground through which one can access the underground. As Diane Spencer said, Curtius Plunge suggests a subterranean and usually hidden depth to the borough that mirrors the capital line in Palatine Heights above it. In addition, it implicitly proposes a prototype zone beneath the forum, the Crepidius de Clark Maxima. So the combination of two bits points to Clark and Maxima as an essential watershed in the history of the forum as the city center of Rome. It enabled the development of the area and city institutions, but it was only a partial solution. Though it was no longer a yearly plot, tiber flooding continued and occasionally reached as far as the forum. The flooding evoked the memory of earlier times when the forum was a watery depression between the capital and the palace. Metius' myth is set in the context of the earliest layer we uncover in the palimpsest of space that is the forum valley, the prosaic hall of a marsh. The space of the Velabrum in the archaic period was largely around 7 meters above sea level, and 
and so subject to seasonal climate bugging. The forum was also covered by these plants, but added more water to an already rich hydrological state. Several streams ran through this area, the main one a perennial torrent flowing down the slope of the corridor hill through the center of the forum and into the area of the Balabo where it met the Tiber. The point of convergence between the torrent and the Tiber varied over time. The river rose to cover the forum on an annual basis every winter, according to archaeological evidence. The continual flooding prevented the area from developing into a proper city center and necessitated a project to deal with the issue. The level of the valley was about seven meters above sea level, and seasonal tidal of floods reached up to nine meters. A great amount of ground needed to be moved to form a massive landfill <coughs> to raise the level of the valley. Archaeologists estimate 10 to 20 cubic meters of soil were moved to form the landfill. Uh, the project of draining the forum area was extensive and took decades to complete. Alongside the landfill, a long artificial channel called Cloaca was built to contain the forest stream. So basically you get from this to this. Um, and to drain the water left over from the floods. So the Cloaca was not a sewer, which it became much later, but a fresh water channel which followed the natural properties of the terrain and the course of the forestry. The project was crucial in the development of Rome as a city mm. because it gave a form of stability to its center in the forum and enabled permanent stone structures to be built there <coughs> and alongside the Sacraria. The very first pavement was built around 650 BC, followed by another layer around 635. The first building soon followed the palace of the king called Regia, a stone circular temple of Vesta, and further east, another stone structure in the area of the Comitium, which was the first Korea of Senecas. However, all construction projects were compromised by the threat of annual flooding until the ground level was raised above the seasonal type of floods. The archaeological evidence for the construction projects of the 7th and 6th century BC is conclusive. Within the space of a century, the Forum Valley went from a swampy and wooden marsh to a new city centre, complete with pavement and residential buildings. It is difficult to imagine that this transformation, which was crucial in the development of the city, was not remembered. A salient example is the myth of Retrimus, the shapeshifter god, who also had a sanctuary of the tract of the park. <coughs> Whatever we make of the later poetic and antiquarian descriptions of the god, the tradition is consistent in making him the god who turned back the river from the form. It seems that the statue of the turning god Retumnus was a mythic sign of a time when the form was flooded on a regular basis. And uh, also a reminder that flooding could still reach as far as the city centre, the catastrophic So how does this apply? How does, how does the story of the transformation of the forum from a marsh area to a city center apply to our events of Marcus and Nancy's courtiers? Recent advances in memory studies show that all of our memory is reconstructed. We tell a story with a view of not only the past, but also the present circumstances into which we now state. This fluidity of memory matches the changing aspects of the base of Marcus and Metis, both in the wake of a time of flood. Awareness of flooding and its extent may have shifted through time, but the inundations were recurrent enough to make the flood myths relevant and memorable. The time of flood of 363 BC evoked <coughs> the memory of an earlier myth that was linked to flooding. The reconstructive aspect of memory then reshaped the early account to fit contemporary circumstances. <coughs> the marshy spot turned into a great chasm in the committee, <coughs> exposing the psychological gap between the sentence and the people. The
the crisis of being republic was not only environmental, but also political. According to Livy, the ground opened up in 362 BC, the same year that Ganucius, the first ever plebeian consul to command an army, died in a catastrophic battle, which infuriated the patricians and reignited the struggle of the orders. The chasm in the story of Marcus is then not simply a geological feature, but a reflection of social and psychological factors. The construction of Parca Maxima and the land bill that preceded it could not erase the memory of a time when the form was a watery depression between the capital and the Palatine Hills. The myth of Marcus Cortius acts as a sort of traumatic memory, a reminder that the artificially constructed pavement of the forum could collapse at any time and reveal the gap that lies beneath. The geographic feature is transposed to a social reality. The very center of the forum could become unstable and reveal the schism within Roman society. As usual, salvation lies in the figure of a model brave warrior who embodies the best and brightest of the whole state can offer. The threatening chasm that he closes can be interpreted in more than one way. As omens of natural catastrophe frequently accompany and reflect larger social anxieties, the struggle of the orders, one of the most frequent narrative motives in Europe history. The old Gertian lake is reinvented to suit mid Republican circumstances. The heroic model of Marcus Curtius adds further depth to the story and makes this version more popular, as we can see from the fact that it is the one more frequently found in later imperial sources. And Livy also says in places more significant because of this more recent tale. It is in any case the more dramatic myth, and one that speaks better to Roman heroic sensibilities. The exemplarity of Curtius has clear parallels with the stories of Devotio, set in the context of battles, and so has greater weight than a random enemy getting stuck in the marsh. Thus the myth of Marcus Curtius seems to be a development of a devotio type narrative with a geological setting that combines money with political concerns for the big republic. Finally, the elephant in the room is the question of death itself. Why does Curtius, being Matthias or Marcus, die on the spot to begin with? This is not simply a matter of memorable death to make the place more interesting. Again, the devotio motif is apparent but I leave that discussion to guide us and turn my attention to deaths on the banks of the timeline, the sheer number of which is remarkable. <coughs> the very name of the river is almost always explained as a result of kings or heroes who died fighting on its banks, whether they be Etruscan, Alban, or Roman. Aeneas himself becomes a god only after his death in the river of Beacons, and the nymph Anna Perenna follows a similar course. Ilia or Rea Silvia, the mother of Romulus and Remus, ends her life by marrying the time a drowning. And the only temple of the time in Rome, on the time of Ireland, houses the cult of another vestal called Gaia, which implies she had a similar effect. The mythic deaths reflect the toll of body on human lives in the city of Rome. Gregory Aldred, in his book on Tiber Floods, calculates that minor flooding occurred every five years on average and covered extensive areas of the ancient city. A major flood reached as far as the Forum despite several projects that contained the time. The number of deaths caused by flooding is difficult to estimate, but comparative data shows that to talk of a few thousand deaths in the event of a major flood is a reasonable supposition. Modern research shows that flooding still takes an unexpectedly great toll as people underestimate the power of running water. In a moderately fast current, as little as 30 centimeters of running water is enough to knock you down, and 50 centimeters is enough to float a car. In addition to immediate loss of life due to drowning, the receding waters caused a range of problems in the form of various diseases not to mention falling buildings and substantial material losses. There is also the possibility that mythic deaths on rivers reflect not just accidental drowning, 
but possibly human sacrifice. Skeletons of a young couple, man and a woman, were found at the death of six meters in the central area of the forum, next to the base of the so-called Ecus Domitiani, the mission of the Crescent Statue. According to Filippo Corelli, they can be dated to the 7th or 8th century BC, a time when the forum was still annually flooded. The two skeletons seem to have been tied and buried alive right next to the sanctuary of the Doliola, which translates as caskets. This would fit the evidence of Mauro, who says that certain sacred objects are kept underground at the Doliola, along with skeleton bones. Mauro also says that the Doliola are placed on the Clarka Maxima, which implies a direct relationship with the forest tree. The sanctuary is usually identified with a mass of concrete five meters stick, the lower end of which contained pottery hidden under a lid, preserved intact and dated to the second quarter of the 7th century BC, a time when the last stages of the Clark and Maxima were underway. Servius mentions the Doliola when commenting on Virgil's description of the cave of the Sibyl, made of sharp rocks, guarded by a black lake and the shadow of the woodland. So this underground setting reminds Servius of the Doliola. The association of subterranean space with death forms a pattern we repeatedly come across in the sacred places of the world. Subtonic spaces are left dry, like the sanctuary of the Mundus, but others are cleared into water, like the Doliola and Marcus Cortes. It is interesting that human skeletons found in the Doliola had their legs bound, a fact which bears some symbolic significance. The same phenomenon appears in the annual ritual of the Argen, rush buckets taken from 27 different places scattered throughout the city, that were also tied hand and foot and ceremoniously thrown into the time of the Sabistic Bridge in the presence of Vestals and the highest state management. The ritual continued well into the Empire, and the ancient sources are in agreement that the puppets were offered in the place of human beings. The 27 chapels were evenly distributed across the areas of Serbian Rome, and so all the puppets served as offerings for the fall of the community and so <coughs> Though the idea of human sacrifice must remain speculative, given the destructive power of the Tiber, it's not impossible to imagine such desperate attempts to appease the gods at an early period. Coming back to the channel of Cloaca, another sanctuary may have to do with death though not death by water. The Vale of Venus Joaquina is a round stone structure that stands to the south of Basilica Hedia. The myth tells that the statue of Venus was found by King Titus Nations and named Joaquina after the place where he found it. According to Pliny, the Romans and the Sabines also made a peace treaty here because the Cloaca stream was a border between the two territories. Both armies then purified themselves at this spot which explains the name as Pluravet, was the old god for purifying. It is unclear why a shrine of Venus was placed here. Servius only says Cloakina is one of the names for Venus among the questions. Another female presence here is, of course, Virginia, a girl sacrificed by her own father at the heart of the Sembrial Power Struggle in the mid 5th century BC. Livy relates how Virginius, a noble father, killed his own daughter with a knife quickly snatched from a nearby butcher shop, lest she be molested by a tyrant one of the ten. Ogilvy sees this as a double to the story of Lucretia and points out that Virginia is most likely a substantial virgo, a model of female chastity linked to the place of a sanctuary. It is clear enough that the story was seized for political reasons and Virginia, originally a patrician, becomes a Fabian in later version. However, the connection of a maiden to the suburb of Akina seems older, as a Republican coin from 42 BC shows two women standing on a circular enclosed platform, and one of them holds a branch, probably Myrtle. Myrtle was both used in marriage and purification, so it may be that the well was used as a sacred space for purifications and ritual ablutions. Be that as it may, it seems the sacrifice of Virginia could be another elaboration on the death by water motif. To conclude, 
The sacrifice of Marcus Curtius raises a whole range of interesting issues. The ground opens up in the committee in the form of a simple, which connects the myth to the flood of the Tiber in the previous year, but also the Tiber floods in the Athenians, <coughs> which was the setting of the myth of Nature's Curtius, the same like that. The sacrifice of Marcus is described in terms very similar to that of Devotio, a ritual traditionally ascribed to members of the Desi clan and conducted in the heat of battle. The sudden opening of a gap in the Comitium, right in front of the Croia, exposes the rift between the provisions of the Plebeians, but also links up to other subterranean spaces in the Forum. The Buddha spit at the altar of Saturn, the sanctuaries of Doliola and Venus Plotina, and the lightning shrine in the Comitium. These underground spaces all have different stories to tell, but they share the mystery of death and burial, and all of them, except the Mundus, are located on or next to bodies of water. Water had a great role to play in chronic cults, and death by water is a very frequent motif in Roman mythology. The stories of Matthews and Marcus Curtius were shaped by environmental, environmental factors in the Horn Valley, which was seasonally flooded by the Tiber in the early period. The massive landfill that raised the levels of the Forum and the Channel of Parker Maxima were only partial solutions, and they pointed to a subterranean level forever beneath the Republican pavement. The sanctuaries placed on the ground hid many mysteries linked to death and sacrifice. The fountain of Curtius fed the population with running water, but also served as a place of memory, harking back to the earliest period of Roman myth history and the turbulent times of the Mid Republic.
indicated by this year doing this, and then I'll slow my pace so it's easier for um, our European friends to follow. Uh, and also, if I go on too long because it's a long paper, um, you can just sort of do this, just in the game, and then do it right now. It indicates me, like, hurry up! Okay? And I'll, um, you know, I'll just dump back into pages. But yeah, you can put it there already. I don't do it already. You don't do it already. You have already brought your base. Yeah, and some people remember I had a, a base up in case other people were uh, overly lengthy in their papers, but I had purpose left in the hotel today so that nobody could brandish it at me. Uh, and some of us would go on for a long time. Uh, so before I begin, let me just ask what time it is now and how much time I should not take. So, uh, what time is it? Yeah, it's almost 10, uh, 10 past 12. Okay, and uh, I imagine I will go for 40 minutes. And if I go lower than that and you're hungry, you know, <laughs> brandish your imaginary face or at least tell me about it. As I said, sure. there's a very enjoyable stuff that comes out of this thing. Okay, so here we go. And the camera is on and the sound is okay. Okay. Ancient historians extol heroes of the Roman Republic, such as Horatius Copres and Publius Decius Mus, the father and the son, because they risked or sacrificed their lives for Rome out of altruism and patriotism. And those same sources almost always condemn traditional human sacrifice when the anonymous victim was less willing, even when it was performed to appease the gods and save the state in times of desperation, with the ancient utilitarianism that the survival of the community outweighs the survival of the one. Our mythological and historical sources, such as Euripides, Herodotus, Apollodorus, <coughs> Livy, Frontinus, Plutarch, and others, tell of a score of volunteers who achieved heroic status for their last full measure of devotion, while thousands of anonymous victims of ancient utilitarianism and human sacrifice remain anonymous except in very few cases where they unexpectedly survive or escape. Remember Sinon in uh, Book 2 of the Year, even though this does not necessarily result in divine retribution. It turns out that ancient Romans practiced human sacrifice far later than most of us understand, and most of the heroes who selflessly gave their lives for Rome may partially or fully be human sacrifices that have been enhanced and disguised to sound more voluntary and more patriotic than they really were. And, since Roman AD era opposed human sacrifice and sometimes acted to stand it out, contemporary historians of the late past, of the distant past, disguise these earlier impure acts rather than tell the whole truth, even though they knew their ancestors had earnestly believed that human sacrifice was necessary to ensure the survival of the community. <coughs> False assumptions about sacrifice and the real horror of human sacrifice force us to revisit the true definition of sacrifice and at the same time requires the asking of a second question. Humans perform the sacrifice by giving up something of value to express loyalty, affection, dutifulness, or to seek relief from the gods or a single god. In the sacrifice, one parts with something precious to achieve a greater good such as placating a deity, or winning their affection through undertaking a genuine hardship, try farming that field without your goal. It's difficult. Thus, when the Aztec priest cuts out the heart of an enemy prisoner of war victory and offers it to Quetzalcoatli, hope I said that right, uh, it is an offering, but not much of a sacrifice, except for the victim, because the prisoner of war has little value to the Aztecs. Okay, this poor fellow, I can hear them, this one here, this one, uh, they're offerings, but there's no sacrifice on the Maya, on the Aztec of the Maya, because who cares about the prisoner of war? They're just fodder for the gods, okay? They may be, you know, pleasing to the god, but the Aztec isn't giving anything up by killing this person. So it's not a sacrifice. In the sacrifice, one parts with something precious. On the other hand, compared to the Aztecs, the sacrifice of one's family member is a very heavy loss, perhaps the heaviest loss a mortal can make, because it is so emotionally painful. Thus, it is very rare in the Greco-Roman world. Readers of Shirley J. 
Jackson's a lot of Do any of you know this short story? How many of you have ever raised your hands? Only one. one. Two. Okay. This is a short story called The Lottery. It's from 1948. Readers of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery can recall how enthusiastic the New England housewife protagonist was before she won the lottery. Whereupon, she begins to protest the unfairness of it, even as her neighbors begin striking her with their stones. Okay, she wins the lottery and becomes the town's annual human sacrifice. This is 1948 rural New England. Right. Uh, the writer of this story got more hate mail than any other contributing New Yorker up to that time in 1948. <laughs> Poor her. She wrote that story sometimes. Homer Simpson says, hey, that's funny because it happened to someone else. Okay. But it's never funny when it happens to you. The Olympians might be powerful and immature, but they are very rarely so cruel to demand the most precious thing in your life, your child, as a sacrifice. Whence, we come to ask and answer the second question. Does the God know or care if the human fails to perform the expected, demanded, Sacrifice. Yes, absolutely. And mythology has many examples of this. Mine was deliberately sacrificed the wrong moment. So Poseidon got angry by having Queen Pasiphae commit bestiality with the white ball and then conceive, of course, adulterously, the Minotaur, a great embarrassment to Minos. Artemis took her revenge after Atreus failed to sacrifice his finest sheep to her. And she also defended Admetus for something similar. Peleus forgot to sacrifice to Hera, who then helped Jason against Peleus, including the Golden Fleece, the quest of the Golden Fleece. According to Stesiphorus, Tinnomus forgot to sacrifice to Aphrodite, who punished him by helping Paris and Dr. Helen. After winning the Trojan War, many Greek leaders failed to sacrifice to Athena, who sent a storm to hinder them. Now, similarly, in a Roman urban legend at sea, Publius Clodius Pulcher allegedly threw the sacred chickens overboard because they repeatedly failed to provide a good omen in 249 BC. And then he sailed out and immediately lost the power to fall into the Carthaginians as a punishment. This is the only picture I can find. This is it. So the chickens won't eat. If he says things like, if they won't eat, let them drink. Uh, uh, say no one hit it, be the art. Okay. Uh, in uh, December 218, uh, very early in the Second Punic War, and again in spring 217, after the terrible defeat at Lake Trasimene, we are told by both Livy and Peter that the Romans conducted a series of religious rites to correct previous religious oversights and to ward off the anger of the gods at great expense. The dictator, Quintus Fabius Maximus Comptator, announced that the Decanuri Sacri Stachyundis discover a fault through the omission of proper religious rites, which could only be corrected by precise sacrifices costing 333,333 and a third sesterci, so a third of a million. Historians of Roman religion are very familiar with how Romans attempted to propitiate the gods after serious defeats and of a large number of strange omens, such as talking cows, monstrous births, Strange forms of precipitation, uh, like hail, or blood, or milk, etc. Uh, many of these events were documented by Julius Epsiquins. On rare occasions, a violation of the above rule occurs in a total breakdown of logic, when the sacrifice intended to placate a god or warn off a hostile future does not happen. Then the gods should be angry and punish the community. But often, nothing happens, such as when the sacrificial victims Andromeda and Hesione, who are supposed to be eaten by a sea monster, live because Heracles and, Fish and Perseus come along and kill the sea monsters. Okay. Uh, before every single battle, the Spartan army and the Roman army sacrificed a bull for good omens. On several occasions, when the sacrifice was inconclusive, or worse, it provided a bad omen, the Roman general just sacrifices another animal, and then another, and then another, until you get a good omen. Okay, now remember here, 
Uh, for example, uh, this didn't work out the previous audience spoken. He ran out of patience. And he said, let him drink, and he went out and said, the better the moment, and he lost. And that should reinforce that every Roman general left to wait for a good thing. Famously, the Spartans refused to help the Athenians in 490 BC, before the Battle of Marathon, until after they had propitiated Artemis in their annual festival called the Carneia, because she's a very vengeful goddess. And they refused to fight in the early moments of the Battle of Plexia suffering many unnecessary casualties until they received a favorable omen. That's for uh, I can give you a chapter. 6 point, no, sorry, no, 9 point 33 is right. Not significant. One should not be able to genie the system whereby you correct an unfavorable omen, but apparently you can. This law in the function of sacrifice means one was to overcome the omniscience and omnipotence of the gods just by being loyal. <coughs> which should be a violation of the bounds of morality and no my place, no peace at all time. To me, this is a form of hubris, but it's practiced widely. More critical readers of Livy consider his version of events before 280 BC as literary history, where history is epic, rather than real history. Cicero and Livy enshrined a canon of heroes who sacrificed themselves for Rome repeatedly, uh, repeated by many later authors, such as Plutarch, Florus, Martinus, Hesestyle, and so on. Down and beyond, Shakespeare, uh, Dante, Racine, uh, and in the last century in England, more famously, Macaulay, who had this series, The Ladies of Ancient Rome. Uh, and still there are many authors today, I'm sure, although I'm not familiar with them. Uh, Tom Holland, and they, they repeat some of these stories, I'm sure. The division between voluntary self-sacrifice and ritual execution looks black and white, but the sands of time have rewritten the story too many times for us to recover what really happened. In Polybius, Horatius Copley jumps to his death after his comrades destroy the of Splitius, but Livius Horatius swims to the other side of the Tiber amid the slings and arrows of Etruscan poor marksmanship and survives to be rewarded by his head. Cicero and Livius Regulus broken up. Uh, uh, wrote a note to the Carthaginians and kept another oath to make sure Rome would win the first Punic War by selflessly returning the Carthaginians to a death by torture. Polybius' Regulus was captured alive in 255 BC and never heard of again, but certainly he was swiftly executed. And right away, not five years later, like in the legendary Regulus story. The Romans had an immutable definition of self sacrifice and human sacrifice. Because some heroes, I think, involuntarily gave their lives for Rome. But tradition says they deliberately gave themselves for the sake of Rome. And it turns out, apparently, some villains died for the benefit of Rome. And that's really the Greek Greek and Roman mythology both sense that ancient Greeks and ancient Italians emerged from barbarism to civilized when they halted the practice of human sacrifice. As every classic graduate student from Victorian England knows, the practice of human sacrifice is one of the litmus tests that separates civilized from uncivilized, along with whether or not one wear trousers, or whether your language sounds like this, bar, 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 bar. The ancient Greeks, with rare exception, abandoned human sacrifice far back in the mythological era, largely due to the efforts of heroes such as Perseus, Theseus, and Heracles. Although exceptions occur down to the end of the Mycenaean Bronze Age, approximately 1122 BC, just a traditional date. Okay, so, what I mean is, before 1200, human sacrifice is regular, once a month or once a year in this community. Okay. Uh, after this big change, because of the great heroes of Heracles or Perseus or Pisces, depending on where they live, human sacrifice becomes a not normal event. And that separates barbarism from civilization if you are a graduate student in the period. Uh, okay, you put the next picture. That would be useful. Okay. Uh, the abbreviated list that I'm about to read proves the point. Uh, I'll ask them to do this. First, uh, National Geographic in 1974 made this little story on the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, but it's more about Carthage. And you can see the cover and this little doll. 
young dog just made a mistake, uh, was found at the Tophet, uh, uh, where there were thousands of pots and uh, the semi-preserved remains of many, many children, some of whom may not have been sacrifices, but some of whom almost definitely were. This is still a point of contention among archaeologists of Irish. Uh, and other farmers, peoples do really ugly things, but build a big wicker man and put all these years' annual sacrifices inside the wicker man and set it on fire. Uh, there's a tradition very similar to this in California called Burning Man, <laughs> practiced every year for music lovers, and apparently they no longer sacrifice humans at this event. Uh, and then, of course, you, know, you have the Druids in uh, this picture. I guess this is probably the Mitzvah and the Tea, where the annual victim gets to uh, uh, smell or taste of mistletoe, and then they kill them too. So there are all these other things that get to be and people who are horrible in their trousers and say bye bye. Uh, they do these things, but we survive so Romans, we be mad and do stuff. Except now. Except that's exactly what we are talking about. Today. Well, the same thing. Okay. So uh, this following abbreviated list, and it is abbreviated, even though it's something like four pages, will tell you about these things. Shortly after the founding of Athens, a war broke out with Eleusis. An oracle declared that Athens would lose the war unless King Erechtheus sacrificed one of his daughters. So he does. When the seven champions threatened Thebes, Menelikus, one of the Spartan, sacrifices himself to ensure that Thebes will win. Contras, the last king of Athens, responded similarly to a similar prophecy uh, to prevent the Dorians from conquering Athens. In historic times, the most famous example is Leonidas of Sparta, who entered a similar call by dying for his country at the Mamala. The Romans call this Devotium. Okay, and this is, of course, the same line as 7.220. Uh, I see a common thread among a number of ancient forms of I call them sacrifice, other people have bought them together. Okay. The practice of Sati, and trusting the platform of human games that they were practiced originally. Devotio, a Roman commander in battle. The death of the concubine in a Viking funeral as late as, say, 900. Uh, that one's described by Ibn Khaldun. And the common paradox of Hubert and Sullivan is the Makada. How many of you have seen or read the Makada? The Makada. It's not very well known, surprised. It's Hubert and Sullivan, everybody said that in the 70s. Okay. So uh, in the Makada, the prince has run away, thank you. And he lives in this little town called Tipperton, where he falls in love with this. Mm -hmm. The witch is probably young. Okay, now, the Lord High Executioner must kill someone in order to lose his job. Because he hasn't executed anybody in a long time. And a deal is made whereby the prince, who's in disguise, will marry young young, confess to a crime, and be executed. And then they discover that in Tipitu, one practices some form of sati. So she says in their song, they sing back and forth, here's a how you do. If I marry you, when your time has come to perish, then the being the whom you cherish must be slaughtered too. And they go back and forth for about four verses. And in the end, it turns out she doesn't want to die. How oh, I was surprised. <laughs> so in Sati, which is from India, uh, which can mean good wife, uh, the wife dies at the husband's, on the husband's funeral plan to accompany him in the next life. It's not quite a sacrifice to the God to the end of the world, but something similar. Uh, she's supposed to accompany in the room, very much like gladiators. Uh, Perseus abolished by brute force the practice of sati in Greece, so this is about, you know, 1300, 1250 BC, much to the consternation of the local Messenians, by killing a whole horde of those Messenians who had tried to toss his widowed daughter, Bortone, onto King Heredes' funeral pyre. So Perseus kills them, and he says, anyone else want any sati? And when they say yes, he kills them too. And then after that, any more volunteers for continuing the sati practice? No, I thought not. Yeah, so he abolishes sati. After that, there's no more sati in Greek mythology. The devoted and trusting gladiator, the devoted, uh, sorry, the defeated and trusting gladiator, accompanies the deceased dictator, whether it's a male or a female, on the journey to the underworld as a bodyguard. Not so differently, at a Viking funeral, the concubine who is rather a thrall, whether voluntarily or not, accompanies the deceased to the afterlife along with his favorite possessions. 
She was treated like a queen for a week, then a bunch of ritual sex with his best friends, and then killed. And then she is put beside him on the ship, and the ship is set on fire on the Viking Queen. Many other stories have elements of human sacrifice like this. So very I'll try to go through these quickly. Uh, when Athens brought to the mind as a plague, a plague struck the city which would not relent unless an Athenian named Leos or another guy very bad campus sacrificed their daughters. The family left it, but Athens still loses the war. As a punishment, they have to give a tribute to the Cretans, to Minos, of seven babies and seven youths, who the Minotaur is. All the time, all the time. Okay, uh, this is the key of the cycle of the Minotaur babies. Uh, Athens of Yorkis was misled by Ino, and he thought he had to sacrifice his own children in King Horrific, Hela and Phrixus. But Zeus abhors him sacrifice, so he sends a ram with golden beast to rescue them. Poor Hela, she fell off the ram into the Hellespont, but Phrixus makes it all the way to Phyllis. Uh, like the Andromeda story, the Trojans were compelled to sacrifice Cassione to a sea monster, but Heracles intervenes. Agamemnon at first refused to sacrifice his daughter in the Gemea to obtain the fish twins until the rest of the Greek host threatened him to kill him, depose him, kill his entire family. Uh, and then he changes his mind. And if it's made of sacrifice, we're in some versions, whisked away. But the Greeks thought she was sacrificed. So this is from, I think it's from then, the sacrifice of Virginia. And somebody was going to be able to work with it, who it is. And she's going out to be put to death. Uh, uh, Helen has just fallen off Phrixus in this Roman painting, uh, also from Montaigne. And Perseus is about to kill the sea monster with that thing. Is this mass of the survival. Uh, and um, in this work of Roman art, you have two scenes from the same story. So Perseus is negotiating for Andromeda's hand over on this edge, and he's actually going to kill the sea monster on that one. So uh, and many examples of human sacrifice in Greek and Roman art. There are more. Uh, in his wrath, we know from the Iliad, Achilles sacrificed a dozen children to the sons of the tribes. This is really eerie. And after Troy fell, his son, the Autolemus, also known as Pyrrhus, sacrificed Polyxena on the tomb of Achilles. So I was really amazed that such a thing would be made into a vase. And that they would show, oh yeah, we used to practice human sacrifice. Look at this beautiful vase. Would you like some wine? With your dinner. Yeah, a big, big um, amphora as Polyxena's cook so, right there in the middle. Uh, so right after uh, Polyxena's death, Days later, uh, caught in a storm on his Nostos, King Edomenus of Crete, and a son of the same Minos I mentioned before, despite the chronology being impossible, uh, vowed to sacrifice whatever he saw first, should he safely return to Crete. The very first thing he sees isn't a thing, it's his son. So he's in this terrible paradise like Agamemnon. And he initially recoils to horror. But he does sacrifice his son. Now the Cretans who have to become civilized in the generation in between last and this, uh, they're upset at this. Uh, they used to enjoy Athenian human sacrifices, but now they drive him out for his impatience. So it turns out his perverse act of piety angers his subjects and the gods. So he's forced to go. Uh, you shouldn't do that thing. You know, it's really bad. Uh, Tantalus has a similar uh, unhappy discovery. Uh, and then, just seven years later, according to the story, Orestes and Pilates wash up in Talos, where the locals sacrifice all strangers to Artemis, who would then eventually do this. Uh, Orestes' long lost sister, Iphigenia, who was herself formerly a sacrificial victim, but survived in this version, recognizes her brother and saves him and Pilates. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Rockefeller was less fortunate in the Dutch New Guinea in 1961, since apparently the locals uh, ate them in a ritual. So there's still a little bit of this going on in the 20th century. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, 2.3, lists many, many more examples of human sacrifices than the Greeks that I have not shared. Ancient Italians also practiced human sacrifice. Uh, the evidence included many archaic Roman festivals, the Etruscan gladiatorial games, the Umbrian tablets and testimony of Livy, Plutarch, and Servius' commentary on the Aeneid, 
in particular about the Etruscans, and surprising in terms of character assassination late in the Roman Empire. See also the prices paid by the lives of Mycenaeus and Palomaris in Aeneid 5, and the edge of the side of the way. Uh, all of these are virtually human sacrifices in order that the Roman world <coughs> The other pleasant news is that it was far more frequent than each individual source threats are. According to several different stories, Heracles came from Italy on his way home with Perio's cow, and he plucked right from Rome to the savage inhabitants, including a ban on human sacrifice. According to one tradition, Remus was sacrificed upon the island of Rome, uh, around the Pomerium, just like the builders of the Great Wall of China, where we bury the workers inside the wall. Uh, King Numa Pompilius tricked angry gods into agreeing to accept substitutes for human sacrifices by means of his clever wits. When Jupiter was about to prescribe a mortal's head as a ritual sacrifice to charm lightning upon him, Numa added, of onions, so that he says, you know what, in order, in order to propitiate the gods, we need a head of onion, is how we would do this with thing after thing. Another one is the hair of scraps. Okay, so he's just too clever for the gods. So he alters these wooden human sacrifices made by the altar, and he turns the oath of the vow to the god into a non legal oath for God. Uh, I'm talking about Imogenea and Michael and the brothers there. And uh, Eumenes is the only thing I know that Eumenes sacrificed in the sun. Okay. And then this next one comes up now. So the tablets of Gubbio I mentioned. Here we go. Uh, the French law too, in Bolshe uh, of Mestarda, who is also known as Servius Tullius, shows Achilles committing a human sacrifice, the one I mentioned in the Iliad. Uh, to celebrate the Argon on uh, 16 and 17 March, the Romans threw straw figures of people into the Tiber River instead of real people. Okay, I think uh, you mentioned this, Joshua. Uh, uh, and at the Ferriae Latinatae, at the end of April, puppets were hanging on trees. In earlier times, it was boys. Okay, so more examples of these on uh, In 14 and 15 May, the Western Virgins threw puppets into the Tiber River from the Pons Quintius instead of people like him yesterday. More he was like this. And the uh, movie and tablets will go back one day. Go back one day. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, the movie and tablets are, are only preservation that I know of, of the language spoken in North ancient India. And we have been able to decipher the whole thing, and it tells how to do a ritual to do a and the time is written somewhere around 190 BC. So this is a pretty late episode of human sacrifice. Here. It's about the time of the close of the period. Uh, compare this to the Greek world, human sacrifice was supposed to be abandoned a thousand years later. Now, the Etruscans have frequently conducted human sacrifice in the form of the latter of combat, whereby the losing gladiator loses his life and is forced to the deceased nobleman or noble woman to the other world. Now, to me, this seems kind of intuitive. I don't have a better gladiator come with me to the other world. The guy who's strong enough that he can kill someone, not the guy who's not so strong and he loses because I want to be protected on my journey to the other world. So, I just think, I don't know, they couldn't figure out how to do this. Uh, so, you have the worse gladiator. A number of Samite graves in the Christian Museum also suggest the same tradition we sat in before 300 BC. And Taurus 1.16.7 says the Samnites practiced human sacrifice. So here you see two such examples from the museum that are about eight or nine. So I just took these two because they better pictures than I have. <coughs> uh, now, uh, Pliny, uh, this is a famous line, uh, a famous citation. Pliny, natural history, uh, the encyclopedia NH 30.3.22 says the Senate outlawed human sacrifice. In 454 BC, so we should also verify this in the fall of suggesting that Rome, Romans were practicing human sacrifice up to that time. Although Livy never mentions that, either the practice or the man. Macrobius, Saturnia, and 1.7, the ones who grew the point of human sacrifice, also absent in Livy, were about children were hanged in the Compatalia shrines last performed under Tarquin II. Uh, Lucius Julius Brutus, the first consul, abolished that practice, and he substituted woolen rat dolls, both mania, you see, were similar to monies, in place of human children sacrifices. The combination of all of these earlier accounts that I just gave you paints a pretty bloody picture. 
Nation, in ancient Italy, before it came to the same. They looked all over. A paradox appears in incomplete sacrifices of people like Andromeda and Cassione and Simon, and numerous puns in the trick of gods, and for that matter, the futile sacrifices of the Samnites and the Carthaginians to ward off Roman conquest. If the sacrifice was necessary to placate, say, Poseidon, why does he not get angry and ravage the country when neither Andromeda nor Essilini are sacrificed? Why does Artemis demand a human life if Ajaniya here and other stories else, someone else, uh, and then spare her? If the Carthaginians sacrificed their children to save the state, how, how come the gods failed to deliver? The Greeks never address these inconsistencies. The Romans occasionally do, just now and again. The Carthaginian gods, who are inferior to Italian gods, cannot postpone fate and fail if they were to try. So they don't waste the energy. In the famous Salomon, the Gustav Salomon, the Gustav the Gustav Flaubert's Salomon, the author unwittingly hits the nail on the head. When Hamilcar and Arca cheats the gods their due by sending a slave boy dressed as him to the human sacrifice so that his son would live. The gods are initially deceived, but not for long. And Hamilcar's sister, the Titan Carica, pays the price. As for Numa, miraculously, this guy is superhuman. He charged the gods by dropping the lethal demands with his quick wit. He was a more skillful Prometheus who can outwit anyone, and he spares mankind much grief without paying dearly for it, as a um, paragon of civilization. Now, human sacrifice in the historical period. Someone can watch the time for me, because I know what we're going to do. Why do you do one? Ooh, one of the That I'm about halfway through, but we'll go faster. Even the Romans of the historical period of poor human sacrifice, they employed at least three known occasions to ward off national disaster in 228, in 216, and in 113 BC. And I'm sure that's not all. Uh, after losing the Bible of Canada, the Romans feared for annihilation. So uh, they read the civil books and sacrificed a Gallic man and woman and a Greek man and woman, as they did the other two cases too. Uh, again, the same thing in 113 BC. Uh, after formally banning human sacrifice again for a third time in 97 BC, the Romans began to stamp out human sacrifice abroad, all over the empire, and sometimes used that crime of human sacrifice to justify the war on civilized people, long after the fact that they accept and genocide Carthage. Plutarch, Roman Questions 83, investigated why the Romans were born human sacrifice, merely forbade but did not punish the recent transgression by a Celtic people in about 100 BC in Spain. He concluded it was profane to sacrifice a human to the gods above, but necessary to do so to the gods below, if it would save Rome, especially if the civilized books recommend it. So the Romans don't punish this public trial for an offense they had very recently themselves committed. They just spoke. Amazingly, Kutrak then repeats a false story, surely invented by a hostile pro sola source, that Marius sacrificed his own imaginary daughter, Calpurnia, she should be named Maria, uh, to ensure victory against the two killings in 104 BC. This charge of human sacrifice degrades Marius to minimize his victory against the enemy by borrowing from the ancient Greek topos of sacrificing virgins to achieve victory, seen in Iphigenia and many other places. But it only works if it's believable, meaning human sacrifice is still something Romans might do in extremes. Otherwise, it's just a slander that no one believes. Likewise, Cicero's Archimede Catalan, I think this one's Catalan, was doubly accused of human sacrifice and cannibalism, and a hostile tradition claims that the divine joyous was punished two mutineers by having them sacrifice, i.e., offered on the campus marshes, at the altar of Dis. More on this look soon. The future Augustus was also slain with accusations of human sacrifice in the aftermath of the Perusian War, 41 to 41 BC. Uh, the accusation of human sacrifice is among the most unforgivable political attacks, down there with incest and parasite, so it makes everybody who consorts with you 
unclean unless you say Rome did this. And Augustus doesn't. So I don't believe these charges for Augustus or for Julius. I don't even believe for Catalan. So I'm going to skip that just to tell you. I don't believe that. Uh, remember, in the case of the young Caesar, when he kills all these prisoners of war, this is just revenge. Just as <coughs> the head of Marcus Junius Brutus Seneca back in that. No, maybe not. Um, we'll go back once. He throws the head of Marcus Junius Brutus kind of uh, at the feet of a statue of the divine Julius. Uh, we'll do that the next. Just that. Yeah, I think I probably forgot that. I think I probably forgot that. So there's a statue somewhere. Uh, these are acts of revenge. Uh, similarly, uh, when they defeat Antony the and they're closing in on him in Alexandria, uh, they try to negotiate peace without success, and uh, the young Caesar demands, as part of the terms of the surrender, the last two surviving assassins of Julius, Cassius Parmenensis and Lucius Tullius. And he says, you know, it's annihilation unless you give those two people up. Those two people give them up, they're severely punished and executed. Uh, this is revenge, it's not human sacrifice. It's revenge according to a vow back from 43 BC. Okay, now, oddly, Pliny the Elder claims that Ectel, Nostra, Iclos, we did, even our own times, saw a human sacrifice in the form of Boreara, right where those three human sacrifices occurred in the BC era. Uh, much later, other Roman authors, such as Aphronius and Matinda, and uh, Tertullian, and many others, Condemn human sacrifice, which they say is still going on in the AD era. Modern scholars are very divided over whether the Romans abandoned human sacrifice early or late, and whether it was engaged in 228 as a foreign cult or an authentic Roman thing, but archaic. Uh, so, uh, again, I skipped through this quickly just to tell you it keeps on happening too often for it really to be abandoned. With that in mind, we turn to Devotia and virtual Devotia, Publius Decius Mus and the rest. The ideal of a leader who sacrifices his life for the state clearly normally predates the Roman Republic, Liberal Unitas, Codras, etc. Uh, according to Christel, there were two types of devotion uh, Devotia and Repostia, and uh, a rarely seen but well known Roman ritual whereby the Roman commander sacrificed the army of the enemy. To the gods of the underworld, uh, and Devotio Ducas himself along with them. It's really easy to promise the enemies for me. Who cares if he the enemies left? Now, apparently, there's a third type of Devotio on this previous picture uh, called Devotio Iberica, lately advanced by R.A. Tim and Dr. <coughs> Bishop, uh, for the honor guard that fights to the last man around the leader. Okay, and there are many people to do this the Viking Jarls, the Anglo Saxon. House Carlos, many, many others. Yeah. Now, Livy testifies that several commanders devoted themselves, but he names only the three who be as Theseus must father, son, grandson. Okay. Uh, that ensured Roman victories at Vesuvio and Sentinel in 340 and 295. The grandson survived the defeat at Ascalon in 279, and of course the Romans lose. Uh, more recently, Matthew Lay, followed by John Mary Cole, has suggested that the literary rather than the historical Aemilius Paulus at Canada virtually devoted himself to no avail against Canada, for his last words echoed those of Leonidas at the Mahmoud. Again, Turnus and Matthew and Aeneas during the Sacred Troy virtually commit to devote themselves. Turnus fails, and Aeneas is persuaded by Venus to abandon the meaningless death that will not save Troy. Apparently, other commanders devoted themselves, won, and survived. We don't know who these people are. Because survival is a violation. You're supposed to die if you devote yourself. Uh, the state did not grant their death afterwards. So instead, the devoted commander buries a life-size statue of himself. <laughs> Very strange. This reminds me that unchaste vessel virgins and human sacrifices involve burial of God just as with the living, nearly devoted commander. Uh, so now we turn to Marcus Curtis. Uh, oh, let's get the master of the Prudence in Oh, here's uh, the head of the Prudence of the Statue of Caesar. It's out the Most of the paintings don't show how big the chasm is. He's like, what do you care for the little sinkhole that's as big as this table or both of these tables? But so you can just walk around the sinkhole. In this painting, you understand he's either a 
us. This actually really is a problem. So this is the reason I chose this one thing to over all the others. <coughs> uh, very similar to the book here is the metaphorical death of Medius Curtius and the virtual devotee of Marcus Curtius on the same spot 400 years later. The selfless sacrifice of Revelus and the extinction of the family of Emilius Paulus in 167. Plenty of almost in 750 BC, on the spot where the quarry is now, Medius Curtius was driven into retreat into a lake associated with that, but he somehow survived the experience. He mimics Alcestis and Theseus and the others who go to the underworld and come back alive. I'm going to skip all this. Presley talked about this before. Uh, and let me go to the second. A huge chasm opened to the forum where a divine voice predicted it would close only when it would be her most valuable asset. Gold, treasures, and munitions make no difference, but as we have already heard, Medius Critias jumps in and devotes himself in a virtual fashion. Louis actually uses the words, virtual, say, de lorisse, using to vote, even though the sacrifice was not made during the battle. The parallel is otherwise complete, including the very gods and gestures that Curtius made prior to his sacred suicide. The death of the legendary Regulus is not very different in that he gave his life to further Roman success, along with a series of heroes who fortified Frontinus and Polonitis. Most of these heroes who gave their lives for Rome are forgotten outside the pages of Lydia Florence and Frontinus, perhaps even in Lydia's lifetime. Only Frontinus work was Cornelius Blama, uh, and so he's not a main artist character. Uh, and uh, the Amelia's Palace the Younger, the son of the newly devoted consul at Canada. Uh, and I'm going to skip it because we're going to run later. Amelia's Palace had four sons, of whom he gave away two in adoption to the newly extinct families of Fabius Maximus and Sergius Caipio. He kept the other two as his heir and his spare. He then Two weeks before he makes his triumph, he makes this vow he mentioned, oh gods, avert disaster of Rome, put it on my head instead of Rome. He celebrates his triumph. Two weeks later, both of his sons are dead, and his family will go extinct. So the gods do spare Rome and give it all to him. It's just like a devotion, except that he has to live on, knowing he's the last member of the family, and that a uh, very sad thing for Roman, and the family dies with him. Numismatists uh, will recall the murder of okay. uh, Revelus. Uh, Numismatists will recall this point was made by the brother of Lepidus the Triumvir, who uses the name Paulus and Eulus Lepidus, okay, but he's not actually directly descended from them. Okay. Uh, I think I'm just going to do this last thing a little bit, and then do put it uh, There is an altar of disc which you've never seen in Greek city. In Rome, outside the original Rome, downtown Rome today, so you can see the map. And we went by and took a picture of it back on uh, last week. Uh, so there's a story where these guys offer to sacrifice their, themselves so that their children will live, and they're told to do it at the altar of this. Very strange. And then, because they make the sacrifice, the initial offers, they get to live because they have the proper loyalty. This is the story of Galicius, which is in Festus, Zosimus, and Lewis Maxis. Okay, I'm going to skip quite a this. Go to the conclusion. When many women <coughs> celebrate the thoroughness with which, while many women want to celebrate the thoroughness with which, Romans stamp out human sacrifice <coughs> and they praise the patriotism and self sacrifice of earlier generations of Roman heroes. Many sadly admit, or reluctantly admit, that Romans actually did occasionally practice human sacrifice after prehistory. But just this one time. Just once. Okay? The problem is that each author knows it different just once. And then when you add all these examples together, it reveals a rather bloody unpleasant picture that remains true, because each episode recalls the ruthlessness of Roman utilitarianism, that the needs of society outweigh the needs of the war. So I find it very believable. Romans based Agamemnon's choice, meaning someone had to die that would be survive. And it's hard to believe the victims always did so voluntarily. Just making the Aeneid. For example, uh, Tarpeia may not have been a traitor, but he even sacrifice. Who knows what you wish to do Plutarch answers the question why did Romans think it hideous to sacrifice human beings to the gods, but necessary to sacrifice them to the monies? Well, Romans rarely practice human sacrifice, only when facing a national crisis in response to instructions from the Sibylline books. And thus, such sacrifices are offered to the gods of the inverse world, where down is up, bodies have no mass, 
Gold is plentiful, but of no value. And most rules are backwards compared to our world. This includes the rules of sacrifice. Whereas the enemies of Rome, such as Carthage, Gallic tribes, or Germans, they just murder people to appease the gods of the other world. Romans know that it's not just absurd and ineffective, but actually deviant, abhorrent, and sacrilegious. And we will if we die. That's how we know. In earlier times, the Romans were less dishonest, maybe, than the Roman nation surrounding them. But Sals will tell you that did not know that it was Carthage. And they were certainly just about as sanctimonious as everyone else, or more so, uh, at their smug pride in opposing and exterminating the sacrifice. But those many authors I mentioned revealed the dark truth, even if it actually led to the important events of the civilization for which we should all be grateful. We would not want to live in a We would not want to live in a world where the Carthaginians were the pure force, and we are still sacrificing our children to uh, Baal in the hands of Baal and so on. Yeah. So it is a really good thing for us that we are the pure force. Okay. So, Right. 
correctly speaking about the Celts and the Vikings and the Germans until the Christian times. And, uh, uh, and uh, the most famous, if you want, very late case of the Bolti, for example, in the Battle of Hastings of Taifair, which was in the army of William the Conqueror, and he basically threw, uh, it, uh, the Roma, Roman group, he threw himself fighting in the house of guard yeah. of Hells of and uh, it is all, and before that he, he sings a song of the Roma. Uh, uh, <laughs> about the 
Yes. Or speed up and tear. I mean, the, the dynamic yes. goddess of sky and the world. Okay. Who is second? 